one of the things I said at the beginning of this course is that calculus has an enormous uh, amount of applications in the real world. And out of all of those applications, none of them are as fundamental as uh, talking about physics. In fact, calculus was created by two different men. Uh, in England, it was created by Sir Isaac Newton. And in Germany, it was invented by Gottfried Leibniz. They worked independently of each other and independently came up with basically the same system. Uh, and so we kind of picked and choose and put together um, the modern system based on the work of these two guys, plus a whole lot of people who were building on top of that. But Newton's, uh, Newton's inspiration when he was doing it was he had just basically invented physics. Uh, he had written a really important book, which was one of the most important uh, works ever written in a book, where he lays out all of basically what we know now about motion and energy and forces and gravity and the way planets interact with each other and the way that uh, things crashing into each other, how they react. Um, and so basically that is the dawn of physics. Uh, let me just give a quick plug uh, that physics is out of all the science courses, it was the one I enjoyed the most. It's the one that's closest um, to being a math class. Um, and Ms. Minter is teaching it in the spring. And so if you're looking at colleges and thinking about your major and looking at your plan of study and thinking, ooh, I'm going to need to have some physics courses when I go to college, uh, you might want to see if you can uh, squeeze Ms. Minter's class into your schedule in the spring, because that will give you a good foundation heading off to college. And if she said that if all of her students were calculus students, that she would be able to teach physics uh, with that calculus grounding. So you'd be able to see calculus happening while you were doing it. Uh, at any rate, let's take a look at uh, the kind of problem that you will see from the number one application uh, that, that derivatives have in physics. All right, so off to IXL. So this is IXL J4, which I'm not going to assign to you. You're free to do it if you want to. But when we talk about particles moving in a line and its displacement, so displacement means how far it's moved uh, from its starting point after t hours is 23 minus t squared. And so we want to know the velocity. And the way it works out is that velocity is the rate of change of movement or displacement. And we can kind of think about that. If I'm traveling down a straight road and I travel 55 miles an hour, we might talk about my velocity as being 55 miles per hour. That's the rate of change of my displacement over time. Another thing that you will see uh, is the rate of change of velocity. If my velocity is changing over time, we're going to refer to that as acceleration. For instance, if my velocity is increasing as I'm driving down the road, that's because my car is accelerating. And velocity and acceleration and motion are things that we talk about all the time in physics. And it is a very popular problem that you'll see when you take calculus classes. So instantaneous velocity is talking about the instantaneous rate of change of this function. So when I think about instantaneous rate of change, I am thinking about the derivative. Whenever we talk about slope or instantaneous rate of change, I want poof derivative to pop into your mind because that's going to be the way that we solve that problem. All right. And so heading off to the document camera. So we've got s of t is equal to 23 minus t squared. We want to find the instantaneous velocity when t is equal to 2. So the first thing we're going to do is to find the instantaneous velocity that is the derivative of the displacement function. So s prime of t, one thing you'll see, uh, I should mention just as an aside, is that when you see physics formulas, usually t will wind up being our, our uh, independent variable instead of x because t stands for time. So let's take the derivative of this. So 23, that's a constant, so that's, going to be, that has a derivative of zero, negative t squared. So we're going to keep the negative and the derivative of t squared is 2t. 
So the instantaneous velocity function is the derivative of s at t, which is negative 2t. So to answer the question they're asking is they want to know what's happening when t is equal to 2, which is equal to negative 2 times 2, which is equal to negative 4. All right, so let's head back to the IXL and see if it liked that answer. All right, so let's think really carefully. And so it's going to be negative four meters per hour. That's a rate of change. OK, so we're measuring meters per some unit of time. So that's the rate of change of distance over time. And negative four means that it's if it's moving to the right, it's slowing down. OK, so the velocity is decreasing. And so a negative velocity um, doesn't, doesn't surprise us at all. All right, and so that was wonderful. All right, once again, we can do this quickly. Particles moving along the line, its displacement in centimeters after t minutes is t squared minus 44. Once again, to find the instantaneous velocity, the derivative of this function is 2t. This constant thing is gonna go away. And so the velocity at t equals 1 is going to be just 2 centimeters. The displacement is measured in centimeters. And the time is measured in minutes. So the velocity is going to be measured in centimeters per minute. And since 2t is the velocity, substituting 1 in for that, we get 2 centimeters per minute as the instantaneous rate of change. Okay. So that's going to be a common problem that I want you to be aware of. And now that you know how to take derivatives, this is kind of the first applied problem that you can see that you can be able to solve using, uh, using derivatives.